that the book of Revelation tells us that when we get to heaven, eternity, time will be no more. For all of you who like to sleep in, for some people, they would think I'm going to sleep for eternity. Some people would love that. Some people in my household that like to sleep. Let's pray this morning. The greatest thing we could do today, Lord, the greatest thing we could do this week on and this holiday weekend is to come together and give praise and glory and honour to you. For you are worthy. There is no one like you. And so, Lord, for briefly this morning, because you're a God who doesn't sleep, you're a God who wants to be active in our life, you're a God who speaks to us. We heard that last week. So this morning we just open up our heart briefly. What do you want to say to me? And how then am I to live it out and walk it out this week so that we are your representatives, we are your identity in this earth as we go about our daily life. We just give you glory and honour today in Jesus' name. The Bible is full of promises. And that's what we're, our series is the unshakable promises of God, the unshakable hope. And it's, it's, it's a blessing for us that there's not full stops, but the, that often done the promises go on. Like if we confess our sins, thank goodness it's not a full stop there, a question mark. He is faithful and just to forgive us. Paul writes to the church in Rome and he goes, for the wages of sin is death. Imagine if there's just a full stop there, that's it. But, but, the gift of God is eternal life. And so this morning we're going to look at one of those in a minute. Just a, If we do something, yet the promises of God that come and flow uh, from his promises to us. I don't know if you've ever looked up at the sky and realised how incredible our universe is and how incredible God is. And just realise, in a sense, just how small we are here on earth. If you, don't do it now, but if you go home and you, if you click onto the Google Earth app and type in your address, you'll see the earth circling everywhere. And all of a sudden, it'll find where you live and it's like a little pin dot on the scope of earth. And yet, we often live our lives about how big and how great we are, how big and great but in a sense, we're very vulnerable. We're very vulnerable. Uh, many years ago, they had a documentary on those who went to the moon, and Buzz Aldrin, I think, he went, well, he went to the moon and a half, he went to the moon one and a half times because he never got there, I don't think, the first time. And he took a photo from near the moon, looking back at the earth, and the earth was no, can you see this? The earth was no bigger than this marble. And he took a photo with his two fingers, exactly like that, to show just how vulnerable we are and how small we are, in a sense, compared to the whole earth. And he said, I could literally, and I can't do it to this marble, I'm not strong enough this morning. He said, you could literally, Nelly, just crush the earth between your two fingers. How vulnerable we are. But we live in a world where we think we are the centre of the universe and everything revolves around us. When we were in, with Tony and Sarah in Niagara Falls uh, a couple of months ago, one of the signs, and the water, Niagara Falls is just unbelievable. You, just, you can stand this close and just watch the water non-stop just pouring over the edge. And there's a sign that says that every second there's 2,555,150 litres per second are flowing over that falls. Now, I don't know who had the job to sit at the bottom and try and count, try and work that out, but it is a just an amazing place to visit, an amazing place just to see the power of the water, the power of force, and just to realise that, man, we're not as big or as great that we think we are and that we boast we are. I don't know, um, all of us would have played the game Snakes and Ladders. And to climb up the ladders, you become king of the world and you climb over others to get there. 
and go, look at me, I'm king of the world, I've arrived, and we can allow pride to come into our heart. Pride offers us an ego ticket until we land on the snake, and then we go, Pride says, I can do it all myself. I don't need God. I'm gifted enough. I'm talented enough. Charlotte Gamble, I read a quote of hers this week. She said, pride always shows us up in, t- always shows up in times of our frustration and, and delay and it promotes the benefits of doing it your way and pride gives us a highlight reel of all that you can achieve with pride as your guide but it always conceals the price you will have to pay. Pride brochures are full of pictures of how amazing it will be when we arrive at the top, but it never tells us about what you may lose when you travel its path. Jesus said, you may gain the whole world, everything, and yet lose your own soul. It's why I think, in a sense, we're created as sheep. Because we don't have it all together. We don't know where we're going. And we need someone to lead us. That's why God gave us a shepherd. I remember someone said to me, and not to boast, but someone said to me, the, the day that Jeff and I handed the role as senior pastors, and they said to me, congratulations, they're not in this room, they're not actually in this church, they said to me, you have now got to the top. And my reply was, actually, I'm on the bottom. Because we're servants. I'm a senior servant before before I become a senior pastor. But the world says, if you can just climb up the ladder and if you can just get to the top, you've made it. The Bible in the book of Daniel gives us a picture of someone who got to the top and who was on top and allowed pride into his heart. King Nebuchadnezzar was the king of ancient Babylon. He built the hanging gardens for his wife, one of the seven wonders of the world. He had everything, not only the longest name, but all the riches and all the power that comes with it. In Daniel 3, he builds a gold statue over 30 metres high. I don't know how high this roof is, but 30 metres seems like a long way. And everyone was to bow down and worship at it at the sound of music. Except he didn't take into consideration the three Hebrew slaves who refused and were thrown into a furnace heated seven times more than its usual temperature. And it says as he looked, he saw a fourth man in this fire who looked like the son of God and they were released nothing it says that not a hair was singed their clothing wasn't scorched they didn't even smell of smoke which is good news for some this morning you can go through fire and not smell of smoke for he is with you he is for you and he is in you was King Nebuchadnezzar humbled by all of this outcome no He continued to live as wealthy and as powerful as ever, no room for God but full of pride. When we are full of ourselves, there is less room for God. Can I say that again? When I'm full of myself, there's less room for God in my life. But when we're full of God, there's less room for us and there's room for him and room for others. John the Baptist was a very important man. He's out in the middle of the wilderness baptising people. Everyone, it says, was flocking to John. John had his whole band uh, of disciples. He was the evangelist of the day. He had followers before there was Facebook, before there was Instagram. All of these people were flocking after him and he's out baptising and all of a sudden one of John's disciples come to him and said, hey, everybody's leaving us and they're going over there following that Jesus, like, what's going on? And John says, hey, I'm only here to prepare the way for him. It's not about me. He must increase, but I must decrease. There's nothing wrong with being at the top. 
If God has gifted you, God has blessed you, it is fantastic. As long as you acknowledge that I got to the top because of God's ability, God's sufficiency, God's talents, God's blessing on my life. If I get to the top at the cost of others and I go for position whilst trampling on others or I go for a platform as if it's the be all and end all, if I boast about being at the top and I look down and look at the people underneath me as nothing and don't even give credit to the people who have helped me, I've allowed pride to come into my heart. Nothing wrong with being at the top as long as our hearts. Nebuchadnezzar boasted about it. He says, I built this. I have done this. My money, my power, my ability. He has a dream. Daniel comes along, interprets his dream. Does that change Nebuchadnezzar? No. He continues to live in pride. He says, I run the world. You may not be the king of Babylon today, but you may be king of your office or you think you're king of your family, or people you lead, or a team. He had no one to say no to him. Daniel tried to correct him. God gave him a word, challenged him, but pride killed him, and it will kill you and me. When I'm full of pride, I'm unteachable. I have stopped growing. Proverbs 16.5, the writer says, The Lord detests all the proud of heart. We can think of a lot of things and maybe even some people that we think, oh, God would detest that or some religion. Or... But says that the Lord detests all the proud of heart. That's not others, that's me after looking in the mirror. Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction I love this word. He goes, a haughty spirit before a fall. The word for haughty is proud, arrogant, conceited, self-important, snooty. Have you met any snooty people? You might be snooty yourself. When I'm haughty, full of pride, I'm not trusting in God. What I'm doing is I'm trusting in my own ability. David... I remember one of David's psalms that he, he, he wrote, Psalm 131. And David's words to us ring in our ears here, the 6th of October, 2019. David said in Psalm 131, Lord, my heart is not proud. My eyes are not haughty. I don't concern myself with matters too great or awesome for me. But I have stilled and quieted myself just as a small child is quiet with his mother. Yes, like a small child is my soul within me. O Israel, put your hope in God, both now and always. The Message Bible says this. God, I'm not trying to rule the roost. I don't want to be king of the mountain. I haven't meddled where I have no business or fantasize about grandiose plans I've kept my feet on the ground I've cultivated a quiet heart like a baby content in its mother's arms my soul is a baby content my hope is in you it's being content with your God given space I'm trusting in you I'm relying on you as a little child does, as a baby does with his mother. I was watching Dave this morning, just walking around carrying Jet this morning. He was quiet, he was still, he was content. And David gives us a picture. He said, I, I'm going to allow pride, I'm going to have a haughty spirit, I'm just going to be content as a baby is his son. Nebuchadnezzar had a big fall. You can read about that in Daniel 4. He lived like a beast in the field. He ate grass like a cow. His hair was as long as eagle's feathers. His nails like bird's claws. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't make a movie for people to believe it if you tried your best for seven years until he came to his senses and repented. The cure for pride is repentance. 
is humility. In Daniel 4.37, Nebuchadnezzar says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honor the king of heaven. All these acts are just and true. And he is able to humble those who are proud. In his book, The Unshakable Hope, Pastor Max Licata says, Those who walk in pride, God is able to humble. But those who walk in humility, God is able to use. Pride will kill me. Humility is health to my soul. Pride, we read the other week, is what got Satan banished from heaven. He strutted his stuff. He was not content to worship. He had to be worshipped. He was not content to bow before God's throne. He had to sit on it. And he was not for content for God to be in power. He had to be in power. He became proud. Do I want to follow him? Or do I want to follow Jesus? We'll read about it in a minute. I remember an old... One of the um, old pastors that used to come in many years ago. I can remember his wife preaching a message up at the camp, up at Windsor. That's how clear it is in my head. And she talked about pride. She talked about selfishness. She talked about promoting yourself. And she said, whenever you want to boast about yourself, she said, get off your horse and get onto the donkey. Get off your horse and get onto the donkey. Paul writes to a church in Philippi. Philippi had become a Roman colony. And the Romans would take existing cities and turn them into colonies as if you were living in Rome. The whole town of Philippi would resemble, would be like as if you'd gone to Rome. And Paul writes in chapter 1 of Philippians, he writes to the followers in Philippi, he says, you may live here as citizens of Rome, but live here in a manner worthy of your calling, for you are really citizens of heaven. Even though you're living here as if you're living in Rome, he addresses your citizenship is actually in heaven. And then in Philippians 2, he says, because your citizenship is in heaven, This is how you are to treat people and even those who are ruling over you. Philippians 2 says this. He says, don't be selfish. Don't live to make a good impression on others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't think only about your own affairs, but be interested in others too and what they are doing. Our attitude should be the same that Christ Jesus had. There's a, there's a line for us to chew on for the rest of the year and into next year. Is my attitude the same that Christ Jesus had? Though he was God, he did not demand and cling to his rights as God. He made himself nothing or of no reputation. He took the humble position of a slave or a lowly servant and appeared in human form, and he made himself vulnerable, and in human form he obediently humbled himself even further by dying a criminal's death on the cross. Because of this, God has raised him up. God has highly exalted him. And has given him a name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, that should be me. What have I got there? I've got new. Well, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Yes. Paul says, hey, don't look down on others. Have a concern for others. Lift others up. We live in a world that pushes people down. Lift others up. Let Jesus' mindset become our motivation. In Matthew 11, Jesus just said this. Simply join your life with mine. Learn my ways and you'll discover that I'm gentle and humble. You will find refreshment and rest in me.
You know what happens? Self and pride, if anything like me, want to keep rising in my heart. And Jesus has said, come to me. So whenever I, you know, whenever I refuse to respond to him, whether it's in worship, whether it's in our daily readings, whether it's from a message or wherever, you, whenever I refuse to respond to him, I'm actually allowed pride to come in to my heart. But as I bring my heart to him in repentance, in change of mind and direction, God's promise is this from 1 Peter 5.5. 5. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Gian, come up here for a sec. Gian's God this morning, but well, he's not really God because God's got hair, I think. Go right up. Listen. You, 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 you know people, you will meet people in your workplace, other religions or what, and you think, Phew, God must certainly resist them, but hey, he wouldn't resist me. Hey, we're Hope Point Church, we're spirit-filled. We... Whenever I allow pride in my heart, John's God here this morning, when I try and move forward with pride, God will resist me. <laughs> Could there be anything worse in our life maybe than spending eternity without God, than God resisting us? But I'm the pastor. That would, that, that would never happen. Whenever I allow pride in my heart, God resists me. Thanks, you. But, 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 but he gives grace to the humble. Saving grace, enabling grace, empowering grace, sufficient grace for my past, present, and future. But listen, as I have received grace, then I give grace away to others because I have the same attitude, mindset as the one I'm following. We extend the same grace that we have received. Can I say that again? we extend the same grace that we have received. Every morning we should wake up. I know we don't, and I don't always either. It oftentimes takes me when I'm going for a walk and then I see the sky, I see the sunset, I, the sunrise, I just... God's mercy and grace, forgiveness is available to us every morning. We give away grace the same way that we've received it. Colossians 3 says that, I don't have any coats up here this morning, it's too hot, but Colossians 3 says, because we've been chosen by God for this new life of love, let's dress in the wardrobe that God picked out for us. Compassion. I put it on. Kindness. I put it on. Humility. I put it on. It doesn't mean I think less of myself. It just means I acknowledge that everything I have comes from you. I have life because of you. I have breath because of you. Everything I have, a job, talent, gift, all comes from you. It's not thinking less of yourself because we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. I put it on. Quiet strength. Put it on. Discipline. Or the word patience. I put it on. I wonder why that's the last garment because that's one of the hardest ones to deal with. The opposite to pride is wanting... Sorry. The opposite to those garments is to have pride or wanting my own way or wanting, I've got to have first place. 
And so he says, lay down your selfishness. Lay down your pride, because without you, we can do nothing. That's why when we come and worship him, we do it with extended hands. These garments, I just had this picture of that. It's as if we wake up in the morning, God's laid out all these garments, and we bypass them, and we decide, I'm going to pick this one up and pick that one up. We bypass the wardrobe he's laid out for us. Instead of exchanging our pride, our self, for your offer of grace. C.S. Lewis says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. It's taking up the space God has given you to occupy, God has given me to occupy on this earth, to serve him and to serve others, no more, no less. This came to me from this little book that some of you have in Pastor Beck gave me 52 Hebrew words. I, I can encourage you to get it. And he gives a Hebrew word for humble. I won't try and say it. Probably Walt can say it better than I can, but it's A-N-A-V-A-H. A-N-A, I haven't got it up there. A-N-A-V-A-H. Have you ever been humbled by nature? Have you ever walked through a field of tulips or watched the sunset and have been reminded how incredibly awesome God is and how small you are by comparison? It's humbling. The Hebrew word, A-N-A-V-A-H, is what we translate as humility, but the literal definition means to occupy your God-given space in the world, to not overestimate yourself or your abilities, but not to underestimate them either. There's a story in the Bible about a group of people who tried to build a tower to heaven in order to make a name for themselves. We read about that in Genesis 11. Nothing much has changed, has it, really, in our world today. They wanted fame to be known, respected, and honoured for their achievements. Their motivation was the opposite of A-N-A-V-A-H because they wanted to take up more than their God-given space in the world. They overestimated themselves and their abilities. We live in a world of likes, retweets, followers, fans, favourites, and it's easy to determine our self-worth based on how many or how few of these we have. Again, the social media today, we can live by what people say, whether they like us, whether they don't. I have someone close to me who someone put something on Facebook and social media about them the other day and it was very degrading, very humiliating. And I came to the place where I said, you know what, we're just going to have to drop it and let it go and put that in God's hands. We underestimate our worth or ourselves. That is not anava, it is not humility. Growing up, I was taught that humility was thinking less of yourself by taking up the smallest possible space. But really, it's about being aware of and comfortable with your place. When we do this, we don't take up so much space that it squeezes others out and we don't take up so little space that our responsibilities then fall to others. What if just for today you resolve to serve others by simply taking up the space God has given you to occupy nothing more, nothing less? We read a verse yesterday. Actually, worship him, you can come on. 
I didn't know it was in yesterday's reading, but because we're going to sing a song in a second. about who am I. We're going to think about the fact really who I am is I belong to you. Jeremiah writes, well actually God speaks and Jeremiah writes it down. In chapter 9 of Jeremiah verse 23 he says, listen, the Lord says, whoops, the Lord says, don't boast, the word is brag or rave. Don't boast, rave or brag about how strong you are Or how rich you are. Or how great you are. Or how wise and how smart you are. The Lord says, hey, don't boast, don't brag, don't rave about how great, how wise, how strong, how wise you are. Instead, boast, rave, brag about the fact that You know me, you have a relationship with me and that you know that I am righteous, that I am just and that I am full of love. And not only do you know that, you know this, that these three things I delight in. You know what the word for for boast, brag, rave about there? It's the same word that we use, H-A-L-A-L, hallelujah, that we, it's one of the Hebrew words for praise. It means that we are to boast and rave and brag about how great God is. It's one of the seven Hebrew words for praise. It's the same word that God says, hey, don't, bra- don't boast, rave and brag about how great you are. Or how smart you are, or how strong you are, or how rich you are, or how wise you are, or how far you got to the top in your own effort. Just boast brag and rave about this that you know me and I know you that you have a relationship with me and that you understand and you know that I'm a God who's just I'm a God who's righteous and I'm a God who is full of love and in these three things I delight God resists the proud oh but he gives Grace to the humble. Lord, we come to you this morning with hearts that are so thankful. And as David said, we don't want haughty eyes. We don't want a haughty spirit. We come to you and acknowledge that without you, we'd be lost. We'd be undone that we've received grace. And with the grace we've received, we extend to others. We bring our hearts to you today, Jesus. Your word says in Proverbs 4 that above all else, we are to guard our hearts for out of our hearts flow all the issues of life. Lord, wherever there's anything of pride in me or in us, Holy Spirit, show us so that we're quick to repent and turn from it to you because you're not a God who just resists and cuts us off. You offer us grace. We thank you today for your overwhelming, abundant supply of grace. Today we choose to receive your offer of endless grace for every need, for every situation, for every circumstance. We bring our heart before you, Lord. You told us to have the same mindset as Christ, who humbled himself even to the point of a death on a cross where he was mocked so that we would be free of that spirit. That today, instead of allowing pride and choosing to follow an enemy, Satan, that pride got him kicked out of heaven, we choose to follow you, Jesus, who has made an entrance for us into heaven. 
today, Lord, if there's anyone here that has never, ever just humbled themselves and said, you know what? I need you, God. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again for me. Jesus, I want to follow you. I lay down my life in order to pick up your life this morning. I pray, Lord, today that you would give them the enablement just to be able to say, Jesus, I trust you. I give my life to you. I put my hope in you. I choose you to be my saviour and my Lord today. In Jesus' name, keep us teachable, Lord. Pride says that we know it all, but Lord, we want to stay teachable. We want to stay growing. We started the year off about evergreen and about growing. We want to still keep on becoming more like you, Jesus. And we open up our lives to your offer of grace as we humble ourselves before you. And the fact that you've given us grace for us to give grace away. Let's stand this morning.